Hello, everyone, and welcome to Localized. Um, we're so happy to have you here. You're in for a treat at our uh, third or fourth annual virtual career fair 2024. Today, we're talking to Amit Bhattacharya about how generative AI is impacting new careers in data science. Uh, we're really excited to learn from you, Amit. We're really excited to hear about um, kind of the developments in this new technology. Um, just by way of introduction, I'll kind of give a brief introduction and then I, we'd love for you to introduce yourself. Uh, Amit is a data science lecturer at UC Berkeley. He's also a senior staff member and machine learning expert at IonQ. Um, he's been with us a couple of times talking about various pieces of technology from data science and upwards, but Amit, I don't think I could do justice giving your introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about you? We'd love to hear from you um, uh, going into your presentation. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I can do that, but there's also one slide once the presentation gets started. So maybe then that's one of the very first slides. So I'll do that. That's right perfect. Now. Yeah. <laughs> and then without further ado, why don't you go ahead and get started? All right, great. All right, I'm going to share my screen, share my sound, share my desktop. Great. Does that look all right? Yeah, that's perfect. And then I think just present... That looks great. And I'll put it in slideshow mode and you Perfect. can see that, right? Yep. All great. Okay, great. All right. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. Always be have fun to be back at Localized. I love this platform. I think it's doing great things. So yeah, I'm a big fan. Um, and as um, Salma said, um, I have two jobs. My primary job is I work at, well, IonQ, and I'll talk about that in a second. And I also teach in a data science machine learning program. So uh, hopefully the experience of both doing this every day, plus, you know, teaching about it uh, a little bit on the side. Uh, that's also should be like a good combo of things to help us kind of see what's going on in the current state of the world. Um, all right. So but even before I get started, you know, like, why are we even having this talk, the impact of AI on data science careers? So I just quickly did you know, one of those things on Google Trends, it shows like people searching for AI jobs, people searching for data science jobs. And you can see for a long time, and this is a five-year chart, um, data science jobs were outpacing AI jobs. And then all of a sudden something happened. I don't know what, I think we all know what happened. But um, you can see that in the last, you know, within the last year or two, the interest level in even AI jobs is just gone out the roof and much, much, much more compelling than data science jobs. And, you know, we can argue about what AI means, what data science means, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's fair to say that AI has just replaced many of our words in our vocabulary. People don't say, I do machine learning anymore. People don't say, I do data science anymore. You just say you do AI. And in fact, that would be my advice for you. If you're going to some, you know, VC company and you want funding, there should be AI in your name. You know, you're not going to get funding without AI being your name. No one wants to see that there's machine learning in your name or data science in your name. All of, even if that's exactly what you're doing, that I think the world is just in a moment where that's what everybody is talking about. And that's sort of like the point of this chart. Okay. So um, uh, again, here's my like short, brief introduction and sort of like my career journey. I studied uh, physics, astronomy, and classical literature back at UC Berkeley a long time ago, and also have a PhD in physics. Uh, so that's my educational background. In terms of work, I've had jobs previously, both working in quantitative finance, and then as well as like doing data science and machine learning at, at very, very diverse companies such as advertising, education technology, recently digital media. Currently, the things that I'm doing is uh, UC Berkeley has a master, master's in data science program. It is fully online and I'm able to, able to teach it just like this on, on a Zoom platform. So that's really great. So I do teach, I have been teaching machine learning for the long time, but actually currently, especially in the age of large language models and AI, I'm actually teaching natural language processing, which is one of the foundational parts of many of the models that we see these days. And then professionally, I work at a quantum computing company called IonQ. And um, I can talk about quantum computing all the time, but I'm not going to in this talk. But I do work basically using data and machine learning to help improve the system performance of our quantum computers. And maybe the only one thing I will say, everyone asks me like, wait, are quantum computers real? 
Like, yes, they're real. We have quantum computers. They work. They do things that you expect quantum computers to do. They do not solve problems yet that are unsolvable by classical computers. So, but we're that's what we're working on. So that's like a very quick introduction to myself. And, you know, we'll have time at the end to have some questions and answers. And if people have any questions, uh, feel, feel free to ask whether it's my career background, because this in the end is a uh, career fair talk. But again, we can talk about the nitty gritty itself, which is AI and how it's impacting data science groups. Um, okay, so like these are like kind of like a couple of fun slides to get us started. You know, when we talk about data science, is it the study of data? You know, many things, you know, called material science or, you know, very, there's a lot of sciences in the world, but is data science a study of data? Not really. Uh, similarly, is artificial intelligence actually intelligent? I think we would also all say not really. But, you know, what does all mean? And we're going to look into like some of these terms and try to figure out kind of you know, where, where these terms stand in relation to each other, especially as you're thinking about getting a job and getting the right skills. All right, so this is like a mini agenda. We'll see a few examples of data science. We'll see a few examples of AI. We'll look at the difference between the two. We'll see how the study of data science has changed, which is now basically effectively AI, kind of as we've talked about. And then we'll talk about careers and how to think about positioning yourself as you're going through this large you know forest and there's so many different paths to be taken and there's no one particular trail that actually works um, all right so if we start simple with uh data science something that we've all kind of grown to appreciate is this is very much a part of our life nowadays but let's just go over some kind of basic examples of data science that have been very formative and it's still very very much a part of our world and some of these things we think are artificial intelligence some of the things we think they're just data science and machine learning. So as we're looking at these different examples, please like try to think to yourself, like, hmm, is this something I would call AI and artificial intelligence, or would I just put it in the bucket of data science and a machine learning algorithm? And I think the thing is maybe before we would not necessarily have called it AI, but some of these things uh, people are starting to call AI, even if they basically have been machine learning models and nothing's really changed. Um, all right, so for one example, one very, very simple example, uh, which I think most of us would not call AI, is your email spam filter. You know, basically what happens, you know, this is something, this is probably like my spam, you know, from a while ago, right? Basically, these are all the random things that show up in my spam folder. If I look at it, you can see that there's things in Russian. I don't even speak Russian. Um, there's people trying to sell me stuff, people trying to get me to click on things. And, you know, the spam filter does a pretty good job using an algorithm called classification, which, you know, classifies your email into spam or not spam. And it mostly takes your spam and sticks it in the spam folder. It mostly takes your regular email and puts it in your regular email. Every so often it messes something up and we're, we're kind of okay with it messing up a little bit because we just kind of appreciate that it's not 100%. But again, this is like a model that's been trained on lots and lots and lots of data, and it continues to get trained. Every time you take something that is supposed to be spam and put it into your regular email, it learns that it made a mistake. And then similarly, if you take something regular and you classify it as spam, it learns to know uh, that it's spam. And then things are changing, of course, because the spammers want you to see their emails. And so they have to learn how to adapt to the algorithms and try to figure out how to get the thing is that they want you to see into your regular inbox because that's what they want. Um, all right, so this is a version of uh, machine learning that um, is kind of debatable as to whether it's artificial intelligence or not. Um, and this has been a while. I don't know how much people follow this uh, ancient game, Chinese game called Go, but quite a few years ago, uh, the computer AlphaGo was able to beat the world champion, not just a regular person who enthusiast who likes to play Go like myself, but the best players in the world. Um, and then it didn't just beat the world champion barely. It won in the five game match. It won four to win one. And the world champion himself had said like, wow, like I did not think computers were here yet, but apparently computers are here. Now this you know, historic victory happened maybe like seven to 10 years ago. And I think it was something of a, 
you know, like a momentous occasion in the history of like, I would say artificial intelligence and machine learning, because this game Go is incredibly complex. People did not think that computers were gonna be able to solve this problem for many, many, many years. And basically techniques like deep learning and reinforcement learning, which are the underpinnings of the algorithm for AlphaGo were able to sort of beat the world champion. Now in an interesting, even further, uh, whatever um, improvement, um, this original version of AlphaGo was trained based on a lot of, um, you know, games with humans and professionals and learning how to play the game of Go. They came up with a new computer called AlphaGo Zero, which just skips the steps. It just learns to play the game itself. It just starts playing completely randomly. You just tell it the rules and it learns what works, what doesn't. And it quickly basically surpassed the human level of play. So in a game between AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero, in fact, AlphaGo Zero with no human training won, beat AlphaGo 100 games to zero every single time. So much, much better. So now again, here's a question of, you know, is this intelligence or is it um, just a machine learning algorithm? And we can have a debate, but the point is we're just trying to highlight the things that are on the borderline. Um, all right, so self-driving cars. Here's another example of something that I think we all thought was basically a whole bunch of machine learning algorithms. You're getting a lot of video, you're training this, you're training that. And, um, you know, again, but this is something that is a very complex task. In fact, I'm teaching my child to drive right now and they're 17 and we have do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. So at some level, it's like a very uh, classification oriented machine learning problem. On the other hand, um, there's a lot more to driving than just learn this and learn that. There's people have bad days, people have good days, people are tired, all sorts of things happen. You know, now cars, of course, don't have good and bad days and get tired. And hopefully that's one of the improvements that we're hoping for. So I have a short video that I was going to show you um, that kind of uh, illustrates this point. Okay, we are here in the uh, Google self driving car where inside is obviously driving itself and it's doing everything by itself. And I am here as a passenger. I'm really hoping that Sebastian did a good job in training this because he is not driving right now. And I'm not I driving, am, he drives better than me. I am How at the come? mercy of this car right now. That's true, it does drive better so than me. So why are we talking about self-driving cars here? Why are we talking about self-driving cars? Well, we're gonna start by talking about supervised classification and self-driving cars are one big supervised classification problem. What does supervised mean? Supervised means that you have a bunch of examples where you know sort of the correct answer in those examples. So I know that you have an example of this from the self-driving cars. Yeah, so um, I mean, we, we train our car and we show the car what's the right behavior. When we did the Darby Grand Challenge, uh, we would take it off for a spin and it would very carefully watch us human drivers drive and it would emulate our behavior. And in fact, this is sort of how people learn to drive, right? Yeah, I think so. When I was a child, I watched my parents drive and they weren't particularly good drivers, but I could still copy a lot of stuff from them. Yeah, so it's kind of like uh, in the way the humans drive by watching lots of examples. That's what computers do when they're doing machine learning is you give them lots of examples and they start to figure out what's going on. Yeah. That's what we'll be learning about. And that's totally true. In this unit, you're going to be learning about machine learning the same way we, we program a self-driving car. You're going to program in data and, and test out whether you can make a car go fast and slow at the appropriate time using machine learning supervised learning. That's right. So we're going to be looking at a really cool terrain classification problem that was very important for Stanley. You want to introduce that? So in Stanley's case, uh, it was driving through the desert. And the desert terrain has like ruts and broom. It can be very brutal. So if you drive too fast, you're running risk of flipping over and destroying yourself. So one thing we trained the car to do is to really slow down at the appropriate time. We did this not by writing little rules. We did it by us demonstrating the car how we drive and it would just emulate us. How many miles did you have to drive to train that? Oh, thousands of miles. We spent thousands of miles every day in the desert. Oh. And it took quite a while to make the car really smart. Your poor grad students, I can only yeah. imagine. Well, I was the guy who got the pizza for everybody, but uh, it was a great time because it was no email. We just had uh, us and the software, and every time we got a software back, it was very obvious the car would punish us. Oh, that sounds great. So I think we should probably get started with that. Let's try out a few different supervised classification problems. Yeah, so the unit is all about supervised learning, so let's dig in. Sounds great. Okay, all right, so now that was clearly like mostly talking about machine learning, supervised classification, things that we take in a very kind of uh, more academic light, especially when we're teaching machine learning. But it's good to point out the things that, you know, we think are pretty intelligent, which are self-driving cars, also have at their base a lot of machine learning algorithms. So again, as we're thinking about careers and how generative AI is changing them, we shouldn't take get away from the fact that underlying all of this is an academic field called machine learning, and yet things are changing very, very rapidly. 
All right, so just a couple other, you know, sort of quick examples. So movie recommendations, if I go to Netflix or one of these like streaming services, it's telling me what uh, movies I should watch based on what other people have done that are like me. Uh, similarly, when I go shopping online, you know, it basically says based on the items you've purchased and you own, these are some other books that, you know, we might think that you might want to buy. And so again, these are looking at other people's behaviors. They're based on really large machine learning models and recommendation systems. And again, I don't think people uh, would put this in the bucket of artificial intelligence. But I think back a few years ago when they first came online, it was like, wow, this is really different and interesting and new. All right, so now let's turn a little bit to things that we actually think are closer to artificial intelligence, not these examples of data science that we've more or less been subject to for many years now. So we'll take a look first at natural language processing, which is like sort of like the one of the core parts of this um, AI revolution or what we want to call it. And then we'll look at generative AI, which is um, a little bit different. Now, they're very, very similar in terms of the way the models are trained, we look at large contents of you know, text and written material to understand both how to create new content as well as to like do some of these things. But let's just quickly go through what natural language processing, when you're studying it, what are the kind of things that you're looking at? You know, question answering is basically like, here's a piece of text, please, you know, I'm maybe there's like something historical. And I say, when when did this event happen? And it can look in the text and figure it out. Or you can summarize it. You can take a you know three paragraph thing and say, please give me a two sentence summary of this. And so that is a natural language processing task. Or you can translate from one language to another. Or you can classify. You can say, hey, is this uh, document an example of, I don't know, uh, does it look like a recipe or does it look like, um, I don't know, does it look like a manual on how to you know build something? You know, so food recipes are a little bit different than how to build, you know, something with tools. And yet they have instructions, tell you what to do, tell you what things you need, whether they're tools or ingredients. So you should, should be able to classify between things by looking at the text. So now these are all sort of things that you can do just by analyzing the text. And then there's some other things you can do with by analyzing text. And this is what we see currently in the generative AI world. You can create new content. You can ask, you know, one of these apps to sort of like write you a story or, it you know, tell you something or, you know, again, there's a slight difference between summarizing, you know, taking a large piece of text and condensing it into a, sm a few fewer amount of text and just creating something completely new. And I think that's what we're seeing is the biggest new thing that we've never seen before, which is before when we asked the computer to create us something new, it just seemed kind of like random. And now somehow based on training on all the things, it's able to create new content and not just text content. It's able to write songs. It's able to, you know, make art. Now, of course, the songs and art are sometimes a little suspicious. There are also, you know, notions of like intellectual property and copyright violations. So all of these things are part of this new world, but we are able to create new, new content with these generative AI models. You can also solve math problems. You can do your homework or you can have, write code. Let's say you're not very good at um, Python, and but you still need to write some code to do a thing. You can go back and forth with the computer and have it relatively quickly write you some code. So we will look at uh, some of these examples super quick. So again, and then here's like a giant warning. I wrote it in big letters. These large language models, this generative AI, um, yes, they are creatively doing stuff, but they also like make stuff up. Um, how do these models work? Maybe it's a good moment to stop and figure out how these models work. These models effectively come up with one word and then probabilistically come up with the next word and the next word and the next word. And somehow in this large language model, which is basically optimizing probabilistically what's the next best word, things look pretty intelligent. Things look uh, pretty good. And yet when it's not good, it's sometimes very obvious to us and sometimes it's not so obvious to us. And we're still in this middle world where it makes so, so many mistakes. And, and again, I think there've been a lot, numerous examples in the media of you know, people trying to get away with making something up and um, you know, it's just not working. And you know, someone who's like a practitioner in the field can very quickly and easily spot these things. And so I think right now, the warning, you know, this is why it's in such big letters, I say to everybody is that it is making stuff up and it's supposed to make stuff up because that's how the models work. And so it is up to you to really, really, really check 
to see if it's accurately making stuff up or if it's erroneously making stuff up. Because if it's erroneously making stuff up, you know, you could get into, well, one, the thing may not work, or you might just be doing something wrong, or you might be, you know, possibly getting into worse trouble than that. All right, but let's just really quick at look at some of these examples. So answering questions. Here's something where um, I was interacting with one of these apps and then I wrote the sentence like, who I said, who has more apples in the sentence? And I literally gave it the sentence saying, Sally has five apples and Joe has seven apples. And so this is meant to be a question answering task. Even though I'm using a large language model, um, I'm giving it a very, very specific prompt. And so it says in this sentence, Joe has more apples, he has seven and Sally has five. So that's good. And it's like kind of doing it correctly. All right. On the other hand, it, it can also do something wrong. Um, so this is actually when you ask ChatGPT a question. And this is a little bit of a joke because I went to UC Berkeley and there's a healthy rivalry with Stanford. Um, so I said, which university has parking spots for Nobel laureates? And it writes out something like Stanford University. It turns out that this is wrong because Stanford does not and Berkeley does. And it has a long tradition and history of doing so. So and then I wrote, isn't it Berkeley? And it says, yes, you are correct. And so, of course, this is a perfectly good example where you know, Stanford has lots of Nobel laureates and Berkeley has not lots of Nobel laureates and Berkeley has one, has parking spots for them and Stanford does not. And it's somehow mixed the two up and it doesn't know that it's mixed the two up. It just probabilistically said what it just felt like it should say. And there's no going back and checking except for the person itself. Like you can ask the computer, as I said, isn't it Berkeley? And then it goes back and checks and says, yes, you're correct. You know, Berkeley has used, you know, these spots. But, you know, I didn't check even further. I didn't ask, like, is it UC Santa Cruz? And it didn't go and check and say, no, in fact, it is not, you know, UC Santa Cruz. So, again, I could have gone longer in my interaction with, uh, you know, this chatbot this morning, but I didn't. But this is like a perfectly good example of it not doing the right thing. But the only way you would know is if you knew already the right answer. So again, some of these interactions that you have with these chatbots and generative AI these days almost require knowing the right answer before you even ask it. And so then you can wonder like, hmm, I wonder how intelligent the thing really is if it needs to be checked every single time. And I guess right now I would say, yes, you do need to check every single time. On the other hand, as we get more comfortable with it and as we use these tools more and more, we'll learn to just basically understand what its good spots are and what its not so good spots are. Um, all right, um, here's an example of something that it did pretty nicely, in fact. So I asked, you know, can you write a simple Python function to cal calculate the Fibonacci sequence? And if you recall Fibonacci, that's where you take the two numbers, well, you start with one and you take the last two numbers then you add them together and then you get the next one in the sequence and the next one in the sequence and so on and so forth. And I didn't, I told it not to use it using like a loop, but I said, please use recursion to solve this problem. And in fact, it does a perfectly good job and it writes it using, it writes some reasonable code. And I didn't actually run the code, but um, it looks pretty okay from what I can tell by looking at the back of the code. And so again, you can use it to write Python code, but you it sometimes makes mistakes. You also have to be able to like look at it, test it, make sure that you think it's gonna work for you. And if you have any kind of complaints, you can sort of go back and forth and say, no, I think this line was not correct, or I'm trying to do something different. Or you can use this as a starting point for any sequence doing recursion, and then you can like test it and change it for your own per particular purposes. Um, all right, so now we've talked a little bit about artificial intelligence. We've talked a little bit about data science. Um, so what's the difference? I mean, sometimes it seems like there's no difference and it is seemingly a little bit murky, but let's just, you know, for a working definition, we'll say that AI focus on use cases that result in seemingly intelligent behavior. And then data science, which has been going on for a long time, focuses on sort of extracting knowledge and insights. So you have a lot of data at you know your company or research or wherever you're doing stuff. And you know maybe it's in a database, maybe it's in the form of text, but there's a lot of different uh, techniques and tools that you can use to get knowledge and insights. And machine learning, which is what we've sort of also been talking about, is a core component of both. And there are other techniques in data science other than machine learning. You know, statistics has been around for a long time. There's lots of other probabilistic methods in data science other than just machine learning, but it happens to be one of the core ones that has made lots of improvements for us over the years. And then I think one of the things that we see in AI 
is that AI is almost primarily dependent on machine learning. Um, you're not using a lot of statistics. You're not using a lot of math. You're basically just using these models and so often large language models, but many, many other models as well, because there's things other than text in the world. And this is giving us seemingly intelligent behavior. So this is where I would say like that self-driving car, which is highly dependent on machine learning and neural networks, that's seemingly intelligent that is driving around. And yet it's very, very much a machine learning product. Whereas other things like you know, the chat GPTs and Geminis and um, all these uh, sort of apps in the world, they seem a little bit more just apps there to kind of us bounce ideas off each other, ask questions, you know, make things up, write us code, doing a lot of, lot of different things. And so those seem kind of naturally more intelligent. All right. So if we look quickly at the machine learning approaches, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but these are like the bread and butter things that you teach when you're teaching a machine learning course. You learn the difference between linear and logistic regression. You learn the difference between class classification and clustering. You learn the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. And there's a healthy amount of neural networks and deep learning these days. Um, I'm actually going to skip over these slides or go over them very quickly. Regression is like basically trying to se separate things using some sort of a function. Um, there's also the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning is basically on one side, you're given the answers, you know what the X's and O's are, and you're told to differentiate between the two. Or on the other hand, with unsupervised learning, you don't know how many groups you have, or maybe you know that you have two groups, but no one ever told you which one is exactly in which group. So it's for you as you know, the programmer and the algorithm to determine which are the two groups, which we kind of see here on the unsupervised graph on the right. Um, and then this is one thing that I've actually noticed um, because I have been teaching machine learning in this program for a while, is that times have changed. That even as a instructor in a machine learning course, things are beginning to follow a new path. There's a lot more in from emphasis on neural networks, embeddings, text embeddings, which is the foundation of a lot of these large language models and NLP, and then also the convolutional architecture, which is sort of what we need in order to do more advanced things with just neural networks. And so here's an example of the syllabus for the class that I used to teach. So on the left is the before syllabus, on the right is the after syllabus. And I, you know, Many of them look like there's like some crossover. It talks about, you know, uh, maybe it talks about logistic reg regression on one side. Maybe it talks about gradient descent on the other side. But what the main thing that I'll say is on originally when I used to teach this course, we basically talked about it as one algorithm per week. And we went through the body of all the different things you could learn in machine learning. Nowadays, when we teach the course, which is the one on the right, basically, even though we're learning things like linear re regression and logistic regression, we learn it in the context of TensorFlow, which is like a Python package that makes all of these neural networks easy. And the whole point of the class is for the first six weeks to learn how to do neural networks. Whereas on the other side, you know, in the original class, there was only one week devoted to neural networks. And I think what we realize is the way the world has changed uh, that understanding and learning neural networks is like the core part of machine learning. Um, it's not necessarily the best thing to do, the right thing to do, but it is in the moment, the way the world is, the most expedient thing to do. So we spend the first six weeks of this class, the one on the right, learning about all the infrastructure we need for neural networks. We spent a few weeks, you see week seven and eight, doing some other stuff. And then we very, very quickly come back to neural networks. We use embeddings for text. We do convolutional neural networks. And we talk about different types of architecture design for your networks before we like tackle some advanced topics. So I would say the this is the difference between a older machine learning course and a modern machine learning course. Now, of course, times are changing very, very quickly. The machine learning course doesn't even address uh, natural language processing like head on. It doesn't ha address generative AI head on. But you know, it very it allows you in a very short amount of time to, to be able to get up to speed so that you can learn those things very, very quickly. And I think that's how uh, education has changed in the machine learning and these data science programs. So depending on if you're getting specific training for these kind of things, these are the uh, types of um, algorithms and basically use cases and types of subjects that you want to be studying in your machine learning course. And it's not to say there's anything wrong with cluster analysis. There's nothing wrong with dimension and analogy reduction. These things are not going away. 
they've been here for a long time and they're still very very much a part of the process it's just that they're not in the current line from learning from not knowing anything to being able to use generative ai it is not necessarily the most uh, direct path so that's just something to keep in mind um, all right so again and so as you're thinking about studying machine learning you'll also want to think about studying ai and what does that mean and so a good part of uh, AI we've seen are these large language models and a course in natural language processing is sort of like the underpinning of how all of these large language models work. And then the other thing I would say about studying AI is these chatbots, like you should use them. You know, you shouldn't be afraid of them. You shouldn't try not to use them. Even if you know how to code in Python, I know how to code in Python, but I still use the chatbots to help me code in Python. For one thing, I would like to know what it's doing and how it's progressing and how good it is. And so that is a form of like learning for me. And then the other thing is it can actually make things faster and quicker for me. Um, I don't necessarily have to spend a lot of tedious time doing things that, you know, otherwise like the computer can like spit out very quickly. And again, you remember my giant warning. It's of course like making stuff up as it's supposed to. It doesn't always work. And so that's part of the process of learning how to use AI, which is, you know, trial and error. Like you ask the chatbot a question, it gives you an answer. Maybe it's maybe it gives you some code. Maybe you don't exactly know if the code is going to work. So you cut and paste it into your Python notebook and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Um, but there's multiple ways that it can happen, right? One thing is it just flat out won't work. You'll get a syntax error. So then you can go back to, you know, your chatbot and say, hey, it's not working. And then maybe it'll hopefully give you a correction. On the other hand, maybe it actually compiles and calculates something, but you know you estimate that it's not doing the correct calculation. So then you may also need to like change something on your own. You may need to add a factor of two. You mean to change a plus to a minus, or you may go back to the chatbot and say, "Hey, it looks like it's giving a slightly wrong answer. Can we, you know, iron this out?" And you can go back and forth either in your own thinking, or you can go back and forth in your interaction with the chatbot. So I would say studying AI for a huge amount of us means using AI and using these chatbots that we're kind of subject to. All right, so here's like a funny um, uh, different thing that's going on. People talk about jobs, like what's gonna happen? Are, are the computers all just gonna take our jobs? Um, this is a, a friend of mine. This is actually this 2017. This was written it almost you know months after that um, AlphaGo victory against the Go champion of the world. And the, this person, this friend of mine, was basically making the argument that, you know, I work in the finance sector and I like decide which bonds to buy and which stocks to sell. And it's really just like a lot of pattern recognition. And I'm pretty sure that if the computers can beat the world champion at Go, it can probably do my job a little bit better. And, you know, at 35, I'd rather like learn a new skill than wait till I'm like 45 or 55 to try to learn a new skill because my job has been displaced by, you know, computers or robots or whatever. And so that's just something to like kind of keep in mind that what's going to happen going forward is a huge number of changes are coming and either jobs will change very dramatically with the use of AI or certain jobs may go away, but they may be replaced by others. And so this is sort of like the landscape that you're facing as you're thinking about going into the job market in the current day and age. Um, you know, but there's still like you know, there's plenty to do and there's plenty of like interesting things to come up with. And, you know, I really like this quote because it says the task of the human remain, human brain remains what it always has been. And that is discovering new data to be analyzed and devising new concepts to be tested. And so this is written a very, very long time ago before any of these computers existed in 1950. And yet it still resonates today. Um, all right, so let's just quickly talk about some careers, you know, because this is a, you know, we're thinking about careers, it's a career focused talk. You know, the the traditional data science careers that we've kind of, that exist right now, they're not going away. Um, in fact, you know, this idea of extracting insights and knowledge from data, that this world is very data rich and very data heavy and more and more data is created every day, a lot more than there was yesterday. And so all sorts of, you know, companies, institutions, research, whatever it is that you work, still need this type of analysis and this type of work. It's just that this type of work will also be, you know, heavily, 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 you know, influenced by the use of AI. So all of these 
techniques that we have, you're going to be using them day to day as you do your data science job. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. And the more advanced knowledge you have of how these AI system works is very, very possible that you'll be able to do a lot more creative things with an, a deeper understanding of how these natural language processing models work, how these you know, large language models work, or how any of these models work, you will be able to do a better job with a deeper and better understanding. So that's one thing. And on the other hand, there's going to be lots of new jobs to come. And these are just like, it's hard for me to enumerate all of them, but not everyone will need to have the same technical background. And I'm going to give a quick example of that in just a second. Um, and then the other thing to just kind of, you know, kind of to talk about careers is that there'll be lots of traditional career paths. And just as how data science like kind of augmented many, many traditional career paths, we're going to have you know, healthcare plus AI, coding plus AI, finance plus AI, all of these things, um, you know, will be augmented and enhanced with the use of AI. And so I still think that, you know, as you're thinking about careers in AI, yes, you can do the AI part, or you can learn something else, right? Like you can learn, you know, healthcare and then figure out how to add AI to it. And if you're interested in both, that is going to be a field that continues to exist and, you know, emerges in our current day and age that's going to be very super interesting. All right, so here's an example that I was saying about, um, this is a friend of mine, a different friend of mine. Um, you know, he writes a some sort of a blog or sub stack nowadays about talking about economics related to housing. And so he did some sort of analysis on, you know, which schools in New York City are in neighborhoods where it's more or less expensive, you know? So generally speaking, people think that, you know, in the good neighborhoods, there's good schools and the not so neighborhoods, there's not so good schools. The idea here was to look for, maybe there's like some neighborhoods that are not as expensive, but still have really good schools for some reason. And so he did all this analysis, but I can assure you that he's not a great Python coder and he's not particularly great with data viz. All of this really nice chart that you see has a lot of programming and a lot of analysis and a lot of sort of um, data visualization around it. And he tells me all the time that he could not have done this if he didn't have access to, you know, one of these chatbots where you're going back and forth and saying like, hey, I have this data, compute this for me. I have this other idea, please compute that for me. Oh no, that doesn't look like, let's try this, let's try that. And then he's able to go from like raw data to a chart like this with minimal, I don't wanna say minimal coding skills, but like moderate coding skills. He certainly knows how to code in Python. He certainly knows like how to troubleshoot something, but he doesn't wanna spend his time doing that. He wants to spend his time, you know, doing the analysis of the housing market related to how good the schools are. And then that is a valuable thing in the world that, you know, you don't necessarily have to be trained in computer science. You don't necessarily have to be trained as an AI scientist, you just, have some expertise in economics and you have access to data and you're able to ask questions of it in a much more rich and insightful way than you ever used to before because the tools have gotten so, so good. So, and that's sort of what I was talking about, you know, these fields, some field plus AI can be like quote unquote new field or a new set of worker that's able to do things that has never been able to been done before without either two people being able to do this or let's say I'm able to do this with um, coding and finance, or sorry, co coding and um, data visualization and understanding a bunch of things on the computer, but I would have to understand the landscape of like, hmm, what's going on with the housing market? I would have to learn a lot of things about economics before I could come up with the insights that this person's able to come up with. And so again, marrying the two is a powerful thing and that's something that you'll see going forward. Um, and that's it. Um, that's all I've got. So there is some time for questions if we, um, if we have. Uh, thanks. I mean, first of all, that was really, really interesting. Even for me, I was, I feel like I, I learned a little bit and I'm very interested to, to see the direction that AI takes. Cause I think it has been not necessarily shifting, but like increasing in usability in all different career yeah. paths, including marketing, yeah, um, yeah, which sure. you mentioned. I actually, I have a question for you, uh, if that's all right. But yeah, no, um, sure. you, <laughs> you talked a, a little bit about um, the challenge with information, right? And so sometimes AI gives you incorrect information. And there are a lot of challenges is that AI is solving or, or looking to solve. And then there are challenges in which 
maybe people are looking to solve within AI, things like ethical issues, data transparency, um, privacy, biases, things like this. Are there career paths that are for individuals who are looking to solve those challenges or are the career paths within AI and within data science specifically relative to the usability of the technology within like the scope yeah. of the world? Um, I know. Can you elaborate? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. So I think there definitely are career paths. I think the main thing to remember, well, I think the thing that's maybe a little bit different, which we're seeing now in this iteration is people are asking those questions a little bit more a little sooner in the process. You know, people are asking immediately about privacy, immediately about biases and stuff. You know, even just a few weeks ago, um, I was reading a book and, you know, you like, I was still reading a real book, you know, where you flip it open and you, there's like the front cover, um, but, you know, and there's a copyright page and I don't know why, but I was like, I, you know, I actually went to look at the, the date of like, when was this book written? It said like 1999. And then there was like a little disclaimer. There was an AI disclaimer. They're saying that, you know, no, you know, computer should be allowed to train off of this book, you know, even though it's fiction written by a particular author, it said, you know, like, I do not release this to just be used for training, you know, all generative AI. And if you're going to like create like some generative AI, if you're going to make up a book, if you're going to make up a story and you've trained on my model, I'm subject to some amount of compensation because you company X with generative AI are making zillions of dollars and I wrote a book and you just trained off it for free and you haven't really, what do I get out of this, right? Like I'm effectively training your computer so you can write, you know, new creative literature. And yet you didn't go to school. You didn't like have to like struggle. You weren't like a poor penniless author for, you know, the first 10 years of your life before you made it. And like, where's wh like, what do I get out of this, right? And so that was very, very interesting to see like just even that disclaimer in on the copyright page. And I think exactly like your question is like, you know, what are the career paths here? And I think these these career paths are showing up alongside with like what you called like the usability or the, you know, the good stuff that we want. It's also coming with the caveats and the questions and the guardrails. And I think, you know, one of I think maybe before when we were like, oh, wouldn't it be better to have movie recommendations and not? you know, it's sure it was some violation of our privacy, you know, like taking what movies we've take, watched and comparing it to what other movies other people have watched and giving us recommendations. But for the most part, I rarely hear someone complain like, oh, um, you know, I did not, like I watched Netflix for 20 hours last week. And, you know, of course I watched some things that were suggested to me and they might've complained it was a good suggestion or a bad suggestion, but no one's saying like they don't want the suggestions or not no one, but, you know, like generally speaking, people are not saying that because it, they feel like it's somewhat harmless, you know, like you're suggesting new movies. And yet on the other hand, now we're at a point with AI and sort of like envisioning the future. And I think we've all seen enough science fiction movies of like either great futures or terrible futures. And, you know, people are starting to see like, oh, wait, maybe these, what we're seeing in this AI generation is closer to this like great or not great future that we've kind of envisioned in like science fiction, for example. And so I think people are like rightfully questioning what the powers of the computer are, what sort of guardrails there should be on the computers um, and the training of the models and how, and also how it's monetized. You know, it's fair to say like, you know, maybe this author should get some money if their book is going to be trained off of or their models will be trained off of this other fiction that seemingly otherwise just somebody could just like suck it, feed it into the computer and train off of it. Yeah. And I think also like, yeah. you know, again, there are career paths for it, but there's also, I think as you're doing the job itself, it's much more um, understood that you yourself as the AI practitioner, you should be asking those questions. You're the most likely person to be asking those questions. So I always, you know, whether whether it's teaching or you know leading a group of you know whether it's in data science or machine learning, I always tell the people that I'm working with or my students that it is your you're the primary you're the frontline worker you're the first person writing this code and writing this model you're making the insights happen you're writing the machine learning code or you're doing the large language model you're the closest to be able to answer that hard question which is like is it biased is it um, is there something wrong with the model are we you know sort of 
hallucinating or, you know, what can we do about these things? It is the writer of the model. It's the person that's closest to the data and the code that has the most agency in being able to figure stuff out. Now, I appreciate that, you know, sometimes, you know, whatever, management wants results sooner rather than later, or your boss wants you to get something done sooner rather than later. Um, and there's lots of time pressures. But, you know, I think the conversation now certainly exists where like, hey, I think we need to stop or slow down and, and investigate this realm of it uh, more than just the usability and more than the profit. There's a lot of other things that like need to be questioned and asked before we can kind of like move on with this. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, like, uh, I, we really appreciate you being on here and multiple times, but I feel like every time we gain something new and, um, there's more to learn in this sphere, uh, we really, really appreciate your time yeah. today and the presentation. Um, yeah. and I want to let everybody know that we have a couple of more sessions coming up. Um, there's a session going on right now with Mohammed Alam, uh, talking about careers in mechanical engineering. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, for those of you who have questions um, and want to talk to Amit, Amit, can they reach out to you yeah, directly sure. the, and, and yeah, ask directly questions? On, yeah, anything? yeah, on the localized platform or any other forum of media that exists these days. I'm very easy to find. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so reach out, reach out directly, DM him, let him know, tell him you saw him on localized, um, be direct with your questions. Um, and thank you so much, Amit. We really, really appreciate you being here. Um, and I very much appreciated learning from you. So as I always right. do. So All thanks right. so much. All Talk right. Soon. Have a good one. All right, bye. bye.